Good evening, everyone. Hi. Hello. Happy New Year. Uh, who is here for the first time in Open Forum? Okay. Awesome. Well, welcome. My name is Dr. Hunter Peterson. I'm the Clinic Director of Coeur d'Alene Community Arts. I'm a naturopathic physician, and our clinic is just in downtown Coeur d'Alene on Coeur d'Alene Avenue. So, what you are all at is Open Forum, which is an event we started about four years ago. It's a monthly talk uh, conversation that we do the first Wednesday of every month at 6.30 right here. Um, you'll see little advertisements and Pilgrim's information or on our listserv um, if you want to be part of Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts kind of information distribution that talks about what those topics are. So I come prepared at each class to discuss a specific topic with you guys. But it's also really an opportunity to dialogue. Um, so I'm going to leave a little space before I go into our topic to ask you guys what kind of questions you have about anything and everything health related. Um, and I want you during the talk to raise your hand, interrupt me, let's have a conversation about things. I think it makes it much more interesting and fun for everyone when it's not just me lecturing. Um, so you saw me flip that video camera on. Um, we do record these, so if you want to rewatch some stuff, if you want to share with a friend, it goes on to our website, www.cdaheatingarts.com. Um, you could find us very easily there, and there's a lot of other great information about our clinic, too. Um, so if you want to learn more about our events, our community outreach, we do have this little um, sign-in sheet. I know some of you already spilled it out, but I'm just going to pass it around. Um, and what else is there to share? Um, of course, tonight we're going to be talking, talking about different dietary approaches in detail. Um, kind of thought it was a little bit of a big time, given these few years, and a lot of people like to make resolutions to symbolize a new year and starting off on a new track. So hopefully, this will be a very poignant topic for many of you, um, but usually before I launch into that, I like to take a moment to ask the whole class what types of questions you have, and this is not per se related to the lecture topic, but just any health question whatsoever uh, that you'd like to check in on. So who wants to start? Yes? Um, I have a friend that's been diagnosed with ALS. So I have my gallbladder out, and they have me on a medicine that I don't necessarily like being on, a cholestyramine. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have some sort of a more natural approach to dealing with that. Okay, um, so I'm just going to write again, and the treatment for, rather than write the whole word medically, it's a long word, so I'm just going to say no GP. <laughs> Not having all that. Okay. What else? What other questions? Yes? So in terms of what we're going to be speaking about tonight, I want to know how um, it affects um, arthritis, to how long of arthritis mm -hmm. and how it correlates and sure. how it's tied together. Yeah. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what time, but... Yeah, we'll cover that and, and also just any other <laughs> corollary questions you have related to the topics, just ask while we're going through it, but I'll touch base on that. Acid lowering agents, um, mm -hmm. stomach acid, and yeah. what some of the risks are of that if you're on it. Yeah. <coughs> risks, I'll just say again. Yeah. Acid base or blockers. <coughs> Absolutely. Good one. Yes, Jackie. So, do you just feel wonderful all the time? <laughs> Giving me a personal question. <laughs> I don't like those ones. <laughs> you don't know, and I think that's a really important thing that we don't feel great all the time. Because really, what you know, 
when we don't feel well, it's really our body trying to teach us what's out of balance. And I don't think anyone's completely in balance all the time. And I think that we live in a world where it's really challenging, especially on a kind of um, stress level, to really truly stay in, in balance. But are you a good patient? Like, you know what the right things are to do, and you actually do it. Most of the time, I would say, but, you know, I... <laughs> I'm also definitely, I, I struggle too with compliance, so. That makes us feel better. Yeah, it gives me a lot of compassion for what I'm <laughs> speaking about. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and part of why I was brushing up on these protocols before this lecture is I'm kind of, I felt like I needed to do a little cleanup, but I'm going to be doing one of the, the protocols we're going to talk about today, just for a couple months to, yeah, reset it. So, yeah, what other questions? Rather than my 23, I just have one tonight. Mm -hmm. So um, it recently came to my attention, a friend who had debilitating, maybe cluster, I'm not sure, headaches for most of his life. His wife's got him on oxygen, gone. Another friend, um, same thing. Within less than a couple of days, I went, okay, I got my attention. So what are the negative things about that? Are you speaking of just like oxygen by one of those nasal cannulas or hyperbaric oxygen? Um, the kind you can buy at Big Five. Okay. Or, yeah. So just you know, yeah. taking a little snort when you yeah. think one's coming or yeah, it seems to be working. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just thoughts on. Yeah, um, what, but mostly what's negative oxygen about therapy. It. Yeah. Okay. today is directly the treatment for what's called irritable bowel disease, <coughs> ulcerative colitis as well. But I can also try to make a, a mention too of some of the adjunctive agents to consider. But the main focus would be what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, what's a natural way of dealing with it instead of that medication? Okay. 
Yeah, um, the, the protocols that we're going to talk about today are probably the most direct way, okay. but I can mention some um, agents in the natural world that don't have the side effects of metformin that okay. work as effectively. So I can I can mention a couple of those. So I'll just say metformin alternative. So I wanted to take a little poll at the beginning of our talk to kind of see, get a little gauge for the audience of what are people the most excited about learning about between the three protocols mentioned, which to review if, if you didn't uh, read the flyer or it's not fresh in your mind, it's the ketogenic diet, the GAPS diet or specific carbohydrate diet, and then, well, it's really between those two because I'm not going to spend a lot of time with paleo because it's really just a simplified version of some of the other ones. So, hands for ketogenic. Who wants to learn more and focus most on that? Okay. What about gaps? And specific okay. So, a little bit even, but I think probably the ketogenic has a little more interest. Um, yeah. Which one uh, is the best one for weight loss? Um, I would probably focus on ketogenic uh, as the way to target that. So, yeah. Which one applies more to the blood type diet? Neither. I'm actually not going to talk about the blood type diet a lot tonight. Awesome. <laughs> blood type happens to be an approach that we utilize very heavily in our clinic for those of you who are patients. Um, and it's a great starting point for people. But these are more, we're talking about these diets in reference to specific clinical situations. Um, so I can make mention of it in a couple places, but it's not going to be heavily emphasized in this talk tonight. Okay. So let me paint a little picture in terms of why we're talking about all of this. Um, because, you know, going on a specific dietary approach kind of pleads that there must be a reason you need to change what you're doing um, in order to alter into a specific approach. And I think... Where I want to go with that is really describe the healthcare picture in our country right now and what we're observing. Um, in the 1980s, the, weight, the rate of obesity nationwide was about 22%. Um, or it might have even been in the high teens. It is now about 35%. And this is not overweight, this is actual obesity. This means that you're anywhere from 20 to 50 pounds overweight. Um, compare that number in 1980 to 50 years earlier, and you probably had a number of about under 10%. I don't know that exactly. But it, it's safe to say that there is an obesity epidemic in our country, in, in most of the developed world. And that obesity epidemic I see as the core of a host of conditions that all term metabolic syndrome that afflicts probably one in three adults in the United States. Um, at least, it may be getting closer to one in two. And let me define some of the parameters of metabolic syndrome. Um, obesity is one of them, but there's a very specific mold to that. It's, it's this abdominal visceral obesity where a lot of that weight is distributed in the um, abdominal cavity, which is really not a good place to store weight because it dramatically impairs the function of our vital organs, our liver, our pancreas, our intestines, our spleen, um, stomach. So it's a much more problematic way to just place to distribute weight. Additionally, what we see with metabolic syndrome is high blood pressure. We see dyslipidemia or abnormal cholesterol, specifically low good cholesterol or HDL, high bad cholesterol LDL, and really high triglycerides, which are free-floating fatty acids in our bloodstream, which are the most problematic for cardiovascular disease. We also see, and this is probably most important, a dysregulation of blood sugar metabolism. There's a few terms for that. One is dysglycemia in its most early stages. Another term for that is insulin resistance. And the more, 
um, progressed form or advanced form of that disease process is called diabetes type 2. And currently, estimates are that about 35 million Americans have diabetes type 2. Some of them are children, actually, now. Um, this disease <coughs> essentially did not exist 100 years ago. There were case reports in the medical literature that was like a, a kind of a zebra, so to speak, that never heard of it, really. Now, about 35 million Americans have diabetes type 2, and another 50 million Americans have insulin resistance, um, the earlier stage precursor to diabetes. And what we're often seeing is all of these constellation sy symptoms of metabolic syndrome come together, right? So the vast majority of people with diabetes type 2 or insulin resistant are also overweight. And they often will have dysregulated cholesterol. Um, so, of course, all of those things in and of themselves does not necessarily point to an end-stage disease process, right? These are more syndromes and symptoms and physical parameters that we can objectively measure. However, when this process goes on in the body for months and years and decades, bad things start to happen because all of those phenomenon very dramatically strain your cardiovascular system. They create a tremendous amount of inflammation in the body. They degenerate our joints and they lead to our arteries clogging and our muscles and tissues and organs shutting down ultimately. Um, kidneys shutting down, um, gut shutting down, heart shutting down. And so all the major causes of death, and I'll add in that picture cancer, because cancer is largely a disease of inflammation. So if we put all that together, we see the main causes of death in our country unlike in third world undeveloped countries, unlike 100 years ago, are not acute ailments like uh, a viral disease that causes diarrhea and you die of dehydration or an infection that goes into sepsis, right? That's what people used to die of 100 years ago. What we are all now dying from is the end stage consequences of metabolic syndrome and the obesity epidemic. <clears throat> So any questions so far about the picture I'm kind of painting? Right. So, then the big important question here is, well, what's causing that? Why has this happened? And I really feel that the answer to that lies not in some strange uh, thing about our environment or um, toxins in our world or something like that, I think it has to do with our lifestyles. And predominantly, the two leading driving forces are sedentary lifestyle, meaning lack of activity. You know, our ancestors were walking around about 12 hours a day. Most of us do half an hour, an hour at best of that now. But much more prominently, what has happened to our dietary um, intake? And how dramatically our food supply has changed and how dramatically our eating patterns and dietary habits have changed in the last 50 years, last 100 years, certainly since the Industrial Revolution. Okay. And so what has really, of all things, most dramatically changed is our intake of processed carbohydrates and specifically carbohydrates in general but processed carbohydrates, meaning starches and sugars. We consume those substances at rates that are literally thousands and thousands of times greater than our ancestors. Yet humans don't evolve that quickly. It takes us hundreds and thousands of years to evolve. Our metabolism took millennia to evolve. So changing our diet dramatically over 100 years Clearly, we have not adapted to that, and the consequence of it is this concept of metabolic syndrome in the onset of chronic disease, an inflammatory disease. That's the theory I'm putting out here. And so, in order to reverse this epidemic and ultimately save the health of our society and our healthcare system in general, 
we need to get to the root cause of this, right? Taking blood pressure medications, taking blood sugar lowering agents, taking cholesterol medicines, doing open heart surgery, this is not the solution, right? This is what's bankrupting us and also not re really leading to improving health, but rather treating or mitigating disease. And in my model as a naturopathic physician, I don't want to be looking in the realm of disease management. I want to be looking at building health and seeking the root cause of dysfunction in order to build health. And so, again, when we get down to that, nutrition ends up becoming a bedrock of every conversation with every new patient I see and most every return patient I see, even if I've known them for many, many years. Because what we are and what we eat are really merged together. And it really dismays me that our conventional medical colleagues have very little training in this realm and very little ability to give concrete advice to our patients that are struggling with these epidemic disease processes that, from my standpoint, I believe are driven primarily by dietary any questions about <coughs> concept or how we're framing things? Makes sense to people? Well, you said the, uh, the processed carbohydrates, almost yeah. like, you know, 100 years ago, we can't adapt to that. Would our bodies ever adapt to, to the, car the process? I think it's possible, but I think it would take a long, long time. <coughs> many, many generations, and if we don't change what we're doing, we won't be around as a species in time to adapt to how dramatic the change has been. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, now that we've laid out this picture, right, of metabolic syndrome of obesity, how do you approach it? How do you change things? And I'm going to talk about some very specific dietary protocols that I feel are very helpful in that. Now, would it be wonderful to stop eating processed starches and carbohydrates and sugar? And could that alone dramatically reduce the rate of all of these syndromes and disease processes? Absolutely. And I would encourage everyone to think about that as, hey, this could be a starting point. I'm going to commit to stop eating sugar. I'm going to commit to stop eating things that come in boxes and bags um, and try to eat a whole foods diet. That alone would reverse all of these conditions in a massive way. Okay, so. There's a lot we can talk nutrition, we can do this for many, many hours, but I really want to talk about a specific clinical approach um, that I have found to be really effective at reducing metabolic syndrome and, re and improving or increasing the weight of weight loss in a healthy, safe, sustainable manner. Um, and so I'm going to start with the ketogenic diet. Um, now, as the title suggested, this um, lecture was defined as carbohydrate restricted diets. So, right, the linkage I've created, the theory I've created is that carbohydrates are the culprit here. That there is an issue with how much carbohydrates and in what form we consume carbohydrates, and that leads to all of these really critical chronic health conditions we're dealing with. So, in order to address that, the ketogenic diet is probably the ultimate carbohydrate-restrictive diet in terms of severity and degree of carbohydrate restriction. So let me kind of lay out what the ketogenic diet is, um, where it came from. So probably about 100 years ago or so, when the forebears of actually my profession, the early naturopathic doctors, started to discover that fasting had a tremendous benefit on all manners of health conditions, from chronic disease to acute disease to things like epilepsy and seizures. They noticed that when you did starvation, all of these disease processes would improve dramatically. <clears throat> the problem with starvation is that you can't just keep doing it, right? You, you can't not eat forever. So inevitably, when you bring food back in, all of the issues would resurface. So they went to find, well, what could we do that would mimic starvation 
yet still sustain one's muscles and weight. And they came upon this concept of a really severe carb restriction diet that essentially only allowed the body to consume fat and protein to sustain weight. And they realized that this could be done long term and treat things like epilepsy, seizure, and many other chronic medical conditions. And then the drug revolution kind of swept in and that approach kind of got lost. So fast forward into, I think it was probably the 80s, I think is when the Atkins diet came out, came about, so you remember that? So if you remember the thing about Atkins was that it's all about, you can't eat any carbs, but you can eat as much fat and much protein as you want to. And a lot of people did that, and a lot of people had a lot of success. But because Atkins didn't really back up his protocol with good science and good research, it was come down hard upon by the American Medical Association, and that approach, in large part, has really fallen out of favor. So, as we move forward now into the 21st century, what has happened is a lot more research has been done, a lot more firm backdrop to the science behind ketogenic dieting has been created. And what we now have is this, I think, one of the biggest hot spots in nutrition and kind of dietary fads right now is, the, is, is doing keto diets or ketogenic diets. Challenge here is that a lot of people don't understand what they are and a lot of people don't know how to do them correctly. So I want to really get into understanding what they are and then talk about how to do them correctly and then also talk about some of the clinical conditions besides the obvious of metabolic syndrome, weight loss, that you can apply uh, ketogenic diet to. So are there any questions so far? <coughs> yes? So when you were talking about the Atkins diet and saying that he, his approach was no carbs, when you say no carbs, are you talking like very Very juice, small amounts, like, yeah. There's, okay. there's no such thing as being able to eat right. carbs. Yeah. But this is about extremely restricted as you can be on any dietary approach that is known. So are you gonna go just are you gonna get into like how many carbs a person yes. should? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's critical to talk Yeah, about. okay. Um, okay. So let, let's go through kind of some of the physiology. Hopefully I don't lose you guys too much here. I'm gonna I'm kind of working off of what's one of the real kind of medically, scientifically driven books on the ketogenic diet. It was actually written in the 90s, late 90s. Uh, and this is, I wouldn't recommend anyone actually get this book unless you're <laughs> really nerdy about it and, and want to really read the science of it, but he does a good job. Um, so I'm going to try to paint some broad strokes and not lose too many people in what's really going on with how we establish ketosis. And so I think first we just got to talk about the, the basics, right? Macronutrients. How, so our body, to sustain itself, has to burn fuel. Where do we get the fuel? We get the fuel from eating. We're not like plants. We don't do photosynthesis and create energy from light. We have to eat things to make fuel. So there are three main constituents you can eat, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. And all of those can get converted into energy. The real key thing is they get converted in different ways. And that's the bedrock premise of the ketogenic diet, is we're paying attention to how you convert these different macronutrients in your diet into energy. So the way that we store these fuels, we store them as glucose, that's carbohydrates. We store them as protein. We store them as free fatty acids. And then importantly, the fourth way we can store fuel is as ketone bodies. We probably are very familiar with the first three I mentioned, free fatty acids being fats, protein and glucose, but not many people are familiar with ketones. So what ketones are, are a breakdown product from fat. So a free fatty acid can get converted metabolically by the body in the liver to a ketone body. And why it's called a ketone body is that there's a molecule in it that is a, it, in chemistry it's called a ketone, that's part of the structure of this molecule. And what's really critical there is that when we go into starvation, 
right, when we go into ketogenesis, we deprive the body of all glucose. Remember, glucose is one of our main fuel stores. Problem is that not all of the tissues in our body um, can run off of other sources of storage, like fat. There are some things, specifically the brain and the nervous system, that have to have glucose to operate, at least some. And the important thing also to understand is that the brain can also run off of ketone bodies. And you remember, you can make ketone bodies from fat. Okay, so 75% of the brain's function can be run off of ketone bodies. And so there is a mechanism here to sustain one's well-being and indefinitely <coughs> running off of ketone bodies and fats and adequate protein. And in a really quick nutshell, that's the premise of the ketogenic diet. But let me go into more detail. So how the body determines what fuel to use is based on proportionality to what it has available to it. <coughs> and how our body stores energy, the vast majority of our energy is stored as fat. Because you can pack it in and make it more dense, and we all have a lot of fat cells. We can't really store sugar very efficiently, and we can store protein in our muscles, but protein's a very inefficient way to exchange energy. So we don't want to be making protein and breaking down protein all the time. So it's really an inefficient way to mobilize energy. So if we really need to dig in in a starvation mode and pull energy, the most efficient way to do that is through fat. But, of course, we're eating every day, right? So we're eating three, four, five times a day. So mostly what our body is using for fuel is what's coming in on a regular basis. And so if the body has more carbohydrates coming in, it's going to prefer to use more carbohydrate. If it has more fat coming in, it's going to prefer to use more fat. If it has both carbs and fat coming in together, it's going to prefer the carbs and store the fat. So when I mentioned our obesity epidemic, what I didn't fully flush out is that it's not just that we're eating a ridiculous amount of carbs. It's that we're all still eating protein and fat. And so even if we're not directly storing that carb as fat, which the liver does convert carbs into fat all the time, we're taking that fat we're eating and storing it as fat. So the premise of the ketogenic diet, again, is that when we remove the carbohydrates, the body needs to start utilizing fat for fuel. And when we combine that with a limitation on caloric intake, then we actually lose weight and we reverse a lot of these metabolic processes. So it's really important when we're talking about as the fuel comes in, whether the body selects to use sugar or fat, dependent on what we consume, there are some really important signals involved in that process. And everyone's probably heard the term insulin, right? Pretty much. Okay, that's a hormone. That's a signaling molecule that has a profound role in our metabolism and how we regulate all of the food that comes into our system. It has an opposing hormone that probably many, a lot fewer of you have heard of, and it's called glucagon. Insulin is also known as the hormone of the fed state. Glucagon is known as the hormone of the fasting state. So when there's a lot of insulin around, it tells the body in the fed state, right? We have plenty of energy, so let's store it for a rainy day when we don't have energy. So it tells the body to produce more fat. <coughs> It, it tells the body to synthesize things, build things, and it stores things. That's, it, it fills the liver up with glycogen, short-term glucose stores, and as I said, it creates fat cells very prominently. Oppose that to the state of what's called the unfed state, or the fasting state, you totally plummet your insulin output, and you ramp up your glucagon output. Glucagon does the opposite. It says, all right, we need to keep walking, we need to keep thinking. There's no readily available energy, so we got to start breaking things down to liberate glucose molecules or fat molecules into the bloodstream to make energy out of them, right? Because our cells need to run off of that fuel of glucose and free fatty acids. So glucagon in the fasting state 
will start to break down our fat stores, liberate our short-term glycogen or glucose stores, and drop them into the bloodstream, bloodstream so our cells can make energy out of them. Okay, are we all following so far? Okay. So here's the thing, is that insulin and glucagon, they're very particular to the macro molecule you ingest, right? So whether it be fat, protein, or carbohydrate, that dramatically makes a huge difference in the secretion of insulin and glucagon. Because insulin is only secreted in response to carbohydrate, in response to sugar. So when we have this problem with carrying too much weight around and having too much calories in our body, if we're triggering that insulin signal, it's going to be an awfully challenging thing to lose weight. So we want to adopt a strategy if we're looking to lose weight where we're not pressing that insulin button. And in order to do so, it's critical to consume a low carbohydrate diet because carbs are what trigger the insulin response. Now there's a little nuance to that because proteins do have a pathway that they can be converted into glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis. And it's why when you see people brag about being able to eat a 12-ounce steak, it's kind of laughable because really they're converting about 80% of that into sugar. And they're getting about 20% of that as protein because the body can't handle that much protein at the time. So it converts it into sugar. And in the initial stages of going into the ketogenic diet, while the body ramps up making ketones from fat, <clears throat> indeed it actually does consume a lot of protein. It's partly why it's really important to eat plenty of protein in the initial stages of a ketogenic diet, because it converts that protein into sugar. So I just wanted to make mention of that, that we can't forget sugar turn, or protein turns into sugar. Okay? So, on the contrary, fat does not need insulin to be metabolized and converted into energy. So on a hormonal level, the premise of this diet is we can get insulin levels really, really low by eating a diet that is basically all fat and to a degree protein and really completely eliminating or dramatically limiting carbohydrate. Because we'll drop that insulin level and raise that glucagon level and start the process of fat breakdown. Yes? I've heard that um, I have friends, a couple of friends who struggled with um, anorexia. And I always heard that if you don't eat for a long time, you don't actually lose weight, your body like goes into like, you know, panic mode and like. Yeah, then the metabolism slows down and your body starts to conserve energy. And indeed, that's true. So, this is why, another reason why. Again, for weight loss, you know, doing fasting is not a long-term sustainable practice because when you start eating again, everything returns. Um, you put on water weight again and you start to rebuild your metabolism, um, revs back up, you know, so you're right. It, it, it kind of, the body regulates itself. Um, and water fasting is a really dangerous thing. You have to do it in a monitored inpatient setting because your electrolytes can get way out of balance. You can have such profound detox symptoms that you literally need to be hospitalized. So I only water fast people under very specific circumstances, really closely supervised. Um, yeah? I'm just wondering if the ketogenic diet can be actually heal and reverse the effects of a fatty liver. Indeed, yeah, it can. Yeah. Absolutely. Can take some time. Well, no, I mean, a fatty liver is, fatty liver I could have mentioned in the context of metabolic syndrome. It is definitely one of the classic features we see in this issue with a high carb diet and the accompanying weight gain, high blood pressure, central obesity, right? This <coughs> fatty liver, it's, it's fat infiltration of the liver. And remember how I talked about Metabolic syndrome is about that truncal fat, so that's one of the manifestations. And yes, this direct this diet will directly address that pattern. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you going to talk about which fats and proteins are the best? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, to a degree. 
So, when we, we, we got through the hormones, we talked about what triggers these processes. We talked about how a ketone body is made, right? When there's no carbs around, then the body says, all right, the brain needs energy, the muscles, the tissues need energy. All the t tissues that can use fat, they're going to use fat, but the tissues that can't, we're going to convert those fats into ketone bodies. And ketone bodies, the way to know that the body is doing this is we can actually measure them. You can kind of smell it on someone's breath. It's a little bit of a sweet smell. But the medical way to monitor and supervise it is to do urine test strips. Because when you go into full-blown ketosis, as it's called, those ketone bodies start to spill out into the urine. The body always makes a trace amount of ketones, always. But obviously in ketosis, it becomes a, a huge amount. You're making somewhere around 100 grams a day. And some of that spills out in the urine, so you can actually measure ketosis. Important, yeah? How hard is that on your kidneys? Yeah, good question. Actually, there's very little research, c concrete research, to suggest that there's any negative impact on the kidneys. And I would argue that we can even further diminish that impact by doing my iteration of what I do with ketogenic with people, which is dramatically um, overemphasized compared to the online stuff, the importance of fiber vegetables. Because the strain on the kidneys with ketosis has more to do with the acidic nature of proteins and fats, and vegetables are highly, highly alkaline. So that balancing of the acid alkaline effect is, is very well accounted for when high levels of fibrous vegetables are consumed. So is it best to do it like with you and not on your own? I wouldn't per se say that. I'm trying to give you guys the foundational knowledge here okay. in this lecture. Okay. But I would always advocate that, you know, the, the kind of mantra of what I do is personalized medicine right. and care. So everyone's different and I'd never give person the same dietary protocol or nutrients to take because it's very person specific okay. depending on their unique genetic background, biographical background, health history, current health concerns. Okay. There are some people I would choose not to do a ketogenic mm -hmm. diet for. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so, so kind of getting back to the ketones, we convert into this mode of ketosis. And it's actually kind of hard on the body, as I said. You end up burning a lot of protein in that first few days while the body ramps up ketone production, which is why it's important to do plenty of protein in those first few days to spare protein loss. Um, but similarly, I also really, for that reason, when you do ketosis, you kind of got to do it and be committed to it. Because if you crash out of ketosis, you have to kind of go through that roller coaster all over again. And it's actually, that is pretty, I would argue, harder on the kidneys and harder on our metabolism and just creates profound amounts of fatigue for people. Um, yeah, Joe. So it takes it out. So like cheat days, would that take it out? Like a cheat meal? Yeah, would that a cheat meal out? could take you out of ketosis. <laughs> so that's Depends on then? person to person. What's that? So that's kind of bad. That's a bad thing. Then. Yeah, that's not such a good thing. If, huh. you're, tr if you're truly in ketosis, right? Um, so the, the, the piece about that is that, yeah, you, this is kind of one of those things where if you really want to do a ketogenic diet, you kind of got to be serious about it. If you want to do a more relaxed thing, do paleo diet. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, if you want to do a carb-restricted diet. But if you really want to clinically do this for weight loss, for decreasing inflammation, for reducing diabetes, you know, this, this is the most clinically, I guess I'll call extreme um, approach to it. How long does it take you to get back in three days or so that you said? It depends. Some people can click back in within a day or so, but others it can take longer. It's very individual. So it's it's best to really understand that concept that if you commit to this, you're kind of all in with it. Yeah. So obviously someone who's diabetic would benefit from this diet. However, what if you're diabetic and pregnant? Can you, is this an okay yeah. time to consider going into a ketogenic diet? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would be, it would be a very personalized question with the patient because with pregnancy you have to be really careful about how macronutrients come in and also how much detoxing you want to be doing while you're pregnant and the impact on 
you know, fetus. So I would probably generally recommend a more gentle approach. That's 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 not full ketosis. Okay. Just because of how metabolically challenging that is for the individual and the baby too. Yeah. Yeah. What about a ketogenic diet and uh, veganism or vegetarianism? It's almost a non-starter. You just you can't. I mean, I suppose you could do it, but the challenge is there's no proteins accessible because all those proteins that are vegetarian have too much carbs. Theoretically, <coughs> you can do a medical ketosis where you're doing pea protein all day long. So theoretically, you could do it, but as a long-term sustainable approach, I think not. Um, but but in that context, maybe. Yeah, a lot of the people I studied with ketogenic talk about cycling it now. They're starting to say that you can't really stay in ketosis for years and years. Yeah. So they're talking about cycling it, but I yeah. I don't know. If, are you going to talk about that? Not a ton. I mean, I, I think what I'm getting at is the research that has been done has not been over years. It's definitely just been over months. Um, there just hasn't been, a, it's not a huge, you know, there's no money in nutrition research. So, you know, Drugs are where the money is. So we haven't, unfortunately, done these really robust, large clinical trials to show safety and efficacy. Um, but I would lean that way, too. I mean, as you guys are hearing, and I'll describe in a minute, this is a really restrictive diet. It's not evolutionarily, per se, what we're really designed for at all. But it's a very clinically efficient way to reverse some of these processes. Um, and that's, that's why I'm speaking. I think what they say is like take your carbs up to like 150, which is still relatively low. It is, against. yes, that's so, true. So maybe it's not an extreme, go completely off. Yeah, and I'm not per se saying that either. I think a healthy diet is still ultimately one that doesn't have processed carbohydrates and is more focused on fibers, vegetables, and good fats. So I hear that. Um, right. So. Ketone bodies, we know how they're made, we know how they work in the body. I know this has taken a while to lead up to it, but I just want to make sure the, the science of it makes sense to you. So then we get into this place of, okay, if we want to lose weight, does that mean you just eat fat and protein unlimited? I would argue no, because in the end, still, we, we need to have a caloric deficit to truly lose fat. And I guess I should differentiate fat from weight, right? You can lose like 10 pounds of body weight and lose almost no fat, right? Because those are short-term energy stores, that's water weight, that's inflammatory weight. But to truly lose fat, we need to have a deficit in our system of calories. So the nice thing about ketogenic diet, and this is a real key concept, is that when we decrease our carbohydrate intake and we increase our fat intake, we dramatically improve satiety or feeling satiated. And we end up, inevitably, every patient who does this, I see this, they eat less. Even though fat is more calorically dense, overall calorie intake naturally drops, even without creating restriction or limitation. Because fat signals all of these um, hormones and processes in our body that tell us we feel more satiated. So, um, almost without trying, individuals usually are going to lower their calorie intake and consequently contribute to weight loss. Does that make sense? Okay. You don't need to eat as often if you're eating fats because you don't have that insulin roller coaster going where your blood sugar is all over the place. When you do a high fat diet, your blood sugar is super stable. And that's really important because it's those blood sugar roller coasters that make us hungry all the time and make us want to eat more and more and more. So when we get to the actual ketogenic diet, finally, what does it mean? What are the, the nitty-gritty details? So I said it, the most extreme form of carbohydrate extre um, restriction. And remember that protein <coughs> partially turns into carbohydrates, so you have to account those too. But if we're talking about strictly carbs, the boundary that we usually like to shoot for is between 30 to 50 grams a day of carbohydrates. Um, and that's derived dietarily, dietary carbohydrates. Let's define that real quick. What has carbs in it? 
Well, all processed food, so anything in a box or a bag that has starch or sugar, is obviously out. But in addition, with the ketogenic diet, there's a few more food groups that are out. They include um, all fruit, essentially. Even really low sugar fruits like berries still have too much sugar in them. If you're doing those, you kind of blow your, your carb load for the day by eating like a handful of berries. You can't do those. Legumes, any sort of bean, too much sugar in there, too starchy, can't do beans. So the vegetarian question someone had, that's part of the issue there, right? Beans are a major source of protein, can't do them, too much, too much carbohydrate. Additionally, nuts and seeds, believe it or not, still have a pretty high carbohydrate content overall. Even though they're the most fat and a good portion of protein, <coughs> a handful of almonds will give you about 30 grams of carbs. So that's, you know, your day's resources. Then we got to look into the realm of vegetables. So vegetables, it depends, right? Some vegetables have starch in them, meaning they break down into sugar. Good examples are potatoes and corn, are the starchiest vegetables, but also things like sweet potatoes, parsnips, um, even things like cooked carrots and, um, and um, tomato have a reasonable amount of sugar, and you have to be careful with them on a ketogenic diet. <coughs> However, really fibrous vegetables like celery and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and green leafy veggies, um, Many, 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 but these vegetables, uh, zucchini, summer squash, winter squash, a little too much sugar in them, but a lot of vegetables that have basically no starch in them. Those vegetables, don't get me wrong, they're all carbohydrate, but the key is that they're fiber. Fiber does not get absorbed. We can't digest fiber in terms of in our body, so it all passes through the digestive tract. So most of these fibrous vegetables even though they're all carbs, they're almost all fiber. Yeah. So when you're tracking carbs, are you doing a typical net carb? So if it's 15, but there's five fiber, you can say it's Remove 10 the fiber. net carbs. That's correct, yeah. And why does that work with like some of the sugar alcohols, like Atkin bars or whatever? They're like, oh, six carbs, but three net yeah. carbs. I would, I would highly advise people not use those sugar alcohol bars. Mm -hmm because of the negative effects on digestive physiology and fermentation process, which the next diet we talk about will really hit on that. Okay. Yeah, they're not, and, and again, those sugars on your tongue are triggering all those pathways of insulin and, and, and all those hormone pathways that, as if we're getting a sweet, sugary meal. See, and that's what I was thinking, because I stay really low, like I do, I measure my blood instead of the pizza, so it's just like better. You can do it that way as well. And I feel like I range really low, but then my friend's like, because you always get sugar-free coffee, and it probably knocks you out. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you have to remove the sugar out. Great question, though, to bring up. You, you didn't mention that um, rice and grains are weak. <laughs> yeah, so the, the number one category of carbs is grain, all grain, right? So whole grains, starch, <clears throat> right? That's our definition of the main source of starch. Grains are almost all calories from carbohydrate or sugar with some fiber in them. If they're whole grains, they have more fiber. If they're processed, they have less. So those are totally out on this approach. Yes? Um, okay, so you kind of listed some things. I wasn't sure which category they went in. So you were saying like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and the leafy greens are okay. Yes. And then, yeah, and then you said that squash, which category is not okay? Caution with things like winter squash. Summer squash, is unlimited. And then what if you have like rice milk? What happens there? Yeah, rice milk, still too much carbs oh. for this diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess really small amounts of unsweetened <coughs> rice milk, perhaps. But it would have to be pretty small amounts just because ultimately the foundation of it is carb. Yes, the whole point, it, it tastes sweet like sugar is the important, so. That too. That too, but the actual foods themselves are what primarily trigger the insulin. But additionally, the actual sweet taste on our mouth <coughs> still triggers some of those processes. Sugar snaps, peas, bell peppers. 
Yeah, so sugar snap peas have a higher concentration of sugar. Those would be, need to be avoided. Bell peppers, I think you could do a reasonable amount of, but if you cook them a lot, right, when you cook things a lot, you kind of concentrate the carbs. So uncooked carrots, a lot safer on keto than cooked carrots. <coughs> uncooked onion, safer than cooked onion. Uncooked tomatoes, safer than cooked tomatoes. Right, and I'm giving you some nuances here, but there's also a giant list of really fibrous vegetables that you can have a lot of in pretty much unlimited amounts. And that's my distinction, is when you read about ketogenic diet, one of the side effects they talk about is a lot of constipation because you're not eating any fiber. And my argument is you can still do this and eat plenty of fiber. And I think some people are advocating that more so nowadays. And the key there is those fiber specialists. Okay. So that's the, that's the big part about carbs. That's more what you can't have. Of course, now we say you can have protein and fat. How much protein? Depends on your weight. So if it depends on how physically active you are. If you're very, very physically active, you're trying to build muscle and maintain muscle, and you need to have more protein. So usually for someone maybe around 140 pounds, I would say they'd want to be upwards of 80 to 100 grams of protein a day. Just period, just weight. Mm -hmm. 80 to 100 grams of protein a day. <coughs> if they're exercising. If they're not exercising, I'd go to that 80 or slightly below. And that's just to maintain kind of what you have. Because again, your body's going to convert some of that protein into sugar. It has to. Because the brain still needs some sugar. Um, if you're doing it... Um, and you're very physically active, and you're a big bodybuilder, you're a lot heavier, that requirement might go closer to 120 or so. Um, so I would say for maintenance, if you're low weight, you're 140, you're not really physically active, probably 60 grams you could pull off just fine and do, do fine with. Okay, so there's a bit of a range here. Um, so where do those proteins come from? The main sources are meat, fish, eggs. Those are going to be our primary places we gather protein. Because, of course, unfortunately, the plant sources bring carbs with them. And we can't do that. So we're looking at feeding, you know, three to five ounces of animal proteins um, probably three times a day. Something like that. Now, of course, <laughs> I leave dairy out of the picture because we... Humans have so much trouble digesting dairy, but this is the other place you could potentially use a substance on the ketogenic diet, right? Dairy, especially cheeses um, and some yogurts, are basically all protein and fat. So if we're making the assumption that your gut works really well and you digest dairy great, then yes, dairy would be part of that picture too. Um, yeah. Uh, you got to be careful with goat cheese and lactose. I think lactose converts into sugar, and I think most goat cheese has lactose. So it would be more of the dry cheeses, the aged cheeses, that are mostly all protein. A good sheep one's called manchego. That'd be good one. So, um, some of them, a lot of like, emails I've started following with it, they try to eat dairy free, and I'm like, Heavy cream is my best friend right now because sure. getting the percentages, that's what I'm noticing. I feel like when I'm eating fat, I'm eating protein. And so some of that is getting turned into sugar too because they're like kind of equal. Okay. But it's not more. But, and what they say though too is there is a inflammatory. Correct. So And it is inflammatory for most people. <clears throat> but I feel like my body does okay with it. So do I just roll with it or yeah. should I still cut back? And again, that's a real super personal question, you know, based on it. I don't know your health and background, so I couldn't fully speak to that. But certain blood types digest dairy well. If people's guts are really healthy, they can digest dairy better. Yeah. So, I mean, if you seem to do really well with it and you're achieving your goals, probably not a huge deal. Um, so, I, I just want to touch on dairy, but in my iteration of keto, it's de-emphasized. But, of course, if you're technically looking at the constituents, it fits the picture. Um, so lastly, and most importantly, fat, right? So if we're breaking down intake percentage-wise, 
under 10% of calories from carbs, about 20 to 30% of calories from protein, and about 70 to 80% calories from fat is our goal, or something around those lines, 70%. So what are our fat options? Well, there's fat in the meats, there's fat in the dairy, there's a lot of fat in the egg yolks, so you get fat there. But primarily, and, and there is one vegetable, or sorry, fruit that I will highlight, which is avocado, right? So really good friend avocado is to a ketogenic diet. Um, and it's also much more alkaline, less acid than all those meats. So really good option there. But our primary source of fat is going to be oils. And I'm very picky there too. The standard ketogenic diet is just going to say any oil, oil is oil is oil. But I feel like, no, there's distinctly different health outcomes to different oils. So if we're doing low heat cooking or raw vegetables and protein, extra virgin olive oil is my go-to there. There are other good oils like flaxseed oil, um, evening primrose oil, they also are very fragile. I'm a huge fan of extra virgin olive oil. I think it has great health properties. Um, another oil when we're doing a high heat cooking is going to be <coughs> clarified butter. And for that matter, butter, it has very small amounts of dairy in it. So butter, huge part of the ketogenic diet, but clarified butter actually removes the milk proteins from it. And you can clarify butter very easily. So I think clarified butter should be a, a mainstay of a keto diet. And any high heat cooking, use a lot of clarified butter. Um, another high heat cooking oil is coconut oil. I'm not the hugest fan of coconut oil, and I'm probably not going to go into that in detail. Um, medium chain triglycerides, or MCT oil, is a probably more clean source of coconut oil that I like a little more. So putting MCT oil in things would, would work great too. I also really like macadamia nut oil. Um, I think avocado oil and almond oil can work, but my favorite to the extra virgin olive oil for low heat and raw and clarified butter for high heat cooking. Do you know what the temp cutoff is on the olive oil? It's a couple hundred degrees, it's really low. About 180 is the smoke point, I think. And do you know how to measure that when it's saute? Just put it in a food or is it something? Yeah, I mean, it's just safe not to saute with olive oil because it's pretty hard to keep it below that yeah. temperature on the surface. And once it's really smoking and burning, I mean, it's, it's really gone by then. So, yeah. Yeah, later on. Grapeseed oil? Yeah, grapeseed oil could be used. It's a high heat cooking oil, so you could go high heat there if you wanted to be kind of not doing an animal direct. Yeah. So how does the ketogenic compare to the gas in that? Yeah, we're right about to jump into that. I'm culminating ketogenic here. Um, any questions about constituents in uh, ketogenic diet breakdowns of what it is, what we're focusing on? So kind of in a nutshell, right, it's vegetables, animal protein, which also contains fat, and loading everything up with plenty of oils. And those oils can derive in a little different directions, like technically mayonnaise is, you know, mostly oil derived. So I'm not a huge fan of mayonnaise for some reasons, but you can get pretty healthy versions. Uh, the oils they put in them aren't always the best. <coughs> you mentioned with fats, the percentage of the diet it should be, and maybe you said the number of grams, but... Well, that depends that. on how much weight loss you want, right? Uh, so this is the part where if your body's using fat and we're trying to focus on either weight maintenance or weight loss, fat's the real variable you play with. So that depends. It can be anywhere from, for a 140-pound person, um, you know, something like 70, 80 grams of fat down to 50 grams of fat, just kind of depending on what you're looking to do. Generally, though, remember the thing I noted, the satiety thing does a lot of that for you people end up eating less calories because of the carb restriction and what that does to our metabolism and how our brains perceive food. Um, so that, often when I put people on a ketogenic diet, they just start losing weight. Again, because the metabolic process that's causing them to gain weight is all about the insulin and the, and the insulin signal 
stashing fat and that cycle, that vicious cycle it creates. <coughs> yeah, I want to mention that macadamia nuts are, are a really handy thing because they yeah. have a lot of fat, a little bit of protein, and they're easy to carry around right. for preparation. And very little carbs, yeah. It's, it's pro macadamia nuts, thanks for bringing it up, is probably the fattiest nut there is. So they do have some carbs, you can't eat a bunch of them, but if like in a pinch you need a snack, having a, a small handful of macadamia nuts would not totally toast your day. And remember I said 50 grams of carbs, but anecdotal experience has shown me that some people can stay in ketosis closer <coughs> to 100, right? Some people they really have to stay below the 50, so it really depends on kind of where you're coming at it from and what your body's metabolism looks like. I've been, I have been working with ketogenic for about six months and I was struggling to try and really get into it until, and it wasn't until I found a really good app that I could keep track of exactly what was going on. Yeah. And then also I heard about, um, that the kids with epilepsy often get prescribed a ketogenic diet and there's this thing called the keto ratio which is either four to one or three to one. So I've been playing with that and I can take each meal and I mean, regardless of almost what I put in it, if I add enough oil into it, it will, you know, <coughs> flip it. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. keep your body in ketosis. I mean, you can't add a lot of processed stuff, but I mean, right. I've actually been able to add some berries in and add enough oil and you know, <coughs> make that yeah. work. And, and, and I think there, that, that could be true, but most people therapeutically who do ketosis are really trying to do it for a purpose of caloric restriction on oh, yeah, some level. Oh yeah, so then you got too much fat. And yeah, then, um, yeah, and it just keeps, you know, either builds weight or keeps it right where it is. Yeah, and then I also cycle, or I, I, we also use um, intermittent fasting. Yeah. So like a 12 to 16 hour break in eating. Yeah, and that's great too, and I wasn't going to spend a ton of time on that today just because they have a whole other diet yeah, to cover. Yeah, right, but, right, yeah. But yeah, intermittent fasting amplifies, that. what that means is a period every 24 hours where you fast for a specific number of hours, usually between 12 and, well, I usually say 16 and 18. And what that does is after your body burns off all of its short-term energy stores, then it has to go dig it out of fat to get energy to run the body. So that's a nice adjunctive to combine a low-carb diet with intermittent fasting. That's usually how we approach weight loss at our clinic is through that strategy because then you only get to eat twice a day, you're teaching your body to use fat as energy and when there's no energy around, it's digging into your adipose tissue to create energy um, or fuel the body. That's a good point. Yeah, Jack. So this sounds like you don't enjoy food anymore and you're just taking away all the Oh, no. <laughs> challenging for someone to completely adhere to their blood type and do a ketogenic diet just because when you limit some of those key fats it makes it really challenging to sustain in you know for a, a long period of time something like a, a really strict ketogenic diet. So you would do keto more than blood type diet? If well if that was indicated for the situation yeah. Um, I think again this diet I really put this in play Certainly epilepsy or seizures, right? That's a big place. I really put it in play for cancer because cancer feeds on sugar, right? It, cancer, cannot, cancer cannot thrive and grow without carbohydrates. And so putting the body into ketosis is actually, to me, the most profound way to treat cancer through natural medicine and diet, much more so than chemo or any other conventional intervention. Um, I really like... Sorry, a couple questions. I really like ketogenic if someone has really uncontrolled diabetes, if it's like way advanced and we need to do something aggressive now um, to really reverse it. I really like ketogenic when there's morbid obesity or a really strong need to engage in weight loss. And I think, <coughs> as Gina put it, with intermittent fasting, it's a really effective strategy. Um, so. 
those are some of the biggest situations that I bring it up. And so metabolic syndrome though, of course, people with cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, weight gain, visceral adiposity, I mean, um, adipose storage, these are all really good places <coughs> if we want to go full on to implement the ketogenic diet. <coughs> yes? So, um, are you kind of saying there's like two ways to do the ketogenic diet? One of them is with the intermittent fasting, which would be like 16 to 18 hours, and then you eat like yeah. two times, and then the other way would be like just sticking to counting how many grams of the three foods you mentioned. Yeah. The main thing you got to count is the carbs. Because that's what decides whether or not you're in ketosis. The other ones, I would argue you don't have to really rigorously count your protein and fat. I mean, once you get the hang of it, I think probably initially it's important to monitor it. And Gina mentioned she had a lot of help using an app that allowed her to track much more specifically. What about for people who, like, their blood sugar does go up and down? Because I feel like I start feeling sick if I don't eat, like, after a couple hours. Would that go away? Yeah, you typically typically that goes away because that's that insulin roller coaster <coughs> having to do with fats. It might take a little while for your body to adjust to it, and that's why I always tell people it's not a great idea to bounce in and out of ketosis because it's a lot of adjusting to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mentioned some of the, the potential other effects physiologically, um, dramatically improved lipid numbers. You think if you're eating fat all day, would that make your cholesterol worse? No, it does the opposite for most people. Most people have bad cholesterol because of the carbs they eat. And so, most typically, good cholesterol goes up, total cholesterol either goes down or remains the same, LDL either goes down or remains the same, and tr triglycerides plummet, which are, to me, the most concerning lipid constituent cholesterol. So, that improves dramatically. Um, some of the things to kind of Concern-wise, some people do report fatigue. Um, you know, our body runs really efficiently <coughs> off of uh, carbohydrates. So when there's not a lot of carbs around, some people get more tired. I've, I see this in all different aspects. Some people have just amazing energy when they eat ketosis. Other people are pretty tired. Um, so that can happen. Um, I think that I need to make a quick mention of if you are a really intense athlete or doing pretty vigorous <coughs> workouts, this needs to be modulated. We do need to do some carb reloading. It's kind of beyond the scope of this conversation because I have another diet to get to covering. But there is very selective, specific carb reloading while staying in ketosis if you're doing pretty high intensity weightlifting or workouts. And that usually involves loading pro or loading some carbohydrate following the workout typically okay. so any last questions about ketogenic diet what it looks like the science of it what it's used for anything else i can answer about it <clears throat> all right awesome let's switch gears so we're going to go and like i said it i'm not going to really talk about the paleo diet because it's basically an iteration of this next diet I'm going to talk about, but I will make mention to the parameters of paleo diet. But truly in a nutshell, it's like taking our paleolithic ancestors before the advent of agriculture, of, of um, I guess, of cultivation of plants, and eating what they ate. Okay, that's what paleo is. Um, but let's switch gears to GAPS and specific carbohydrate diet. I will start by explaining the history of this dietary approach. So in the early 20th century, there was a doctor named Elson Haas, I believe, who started treating kids with really severe digestive disease. Diseases we now call Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Uh, colitis is inflammation of the colon with ulceration. Very, very destructive disease processes. Um, that now we treat with conventional medications that are immunosuppressive, methotrexate or mesalamine, pretty, pretty intense drugs. Um, that's our conventional approach to them now. Well, back about 60, 70 years ago, this doctor discovered that if he was very selective about the dietary intake, that he could heal and cure these conditions. 
and he, that diet ended up being called the specific carbohydrate diet. I'll explain that in a minute. <clears throat> and what he did, he treated a few hundred kids, but it didn't really get recorded. He didn't write a book. And if it weren't for one of the moms of one of his patients, it probably would have fallen into complete obscurity. Um, however, the mother of one of the patients ended up writing a book about it. You read this, Pam? I've read You bought one? Thanks. Okay, so Breaking the Vicious Cycle is the book that this person, Elaine Gottschall, wrote. And this is Diet for Crohn's Disease, Ulcerative Colitis, Diverticulitis, Celiac, Cystic Fibrosic, Diarrhea. So basically, extreme IBS. So she wrote this book, and in this book, until you know maybe the last 15, 20 years, has kind of been the Bible for people wanting to treat these severe digestive diseases um, with diet. So someone tagged on later on, after reading this book, a physician, and I would say improved upon this book and the concepts in this book. And it's a, a physician in England named Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. And she wrote a book called Gut and Psychology Syndrome. <coughs> GAPS, for short. And so that you're like, oh, the label says autism, ADD, dyslexia, depression, schizophrenia. What, what does that have to do with what we eat? Well, we'll talk about that, but a heck of a lot. So she wrote this book, and I'm going to speak more specifically to the GAPS book because I think it does a more comprehensive job of addressing dysfunction. And so let me take one step backwards and say, I started the lecture by painting a picture of this epidemic of metabolic syndrome, obesity, et cetera. I would argue there's another epidemic going on in our society that has to do with inflammation in the body and really, really compromised digestion and in health of our intestinal lining, our guts. I think that truly, as a naturopathic physician, the seat of our health is in our gut. <clears throat> and the gut is a very, very complicated place where a lot is going on. And we are just beginning to learn just how profound the role of our gut has in shaping every aspect of our health. And so, the premise of the specific carbohydrate or GAPS diet is it is a very detailed, broad spectrum, um, in-depth approach to healing the gut. Um, I think everyone can benefit from it potentially, but particularly this protocol is very helpful for those individuals who over years or decades have really compromised the lining of their gut and the quality of their digestion and absorption. And as a consequence of that, have developed all sorts of issues, not just in the gut, like things like diarrhea, constipation, bloating, reflux or heartburn, um, but systemic things like allergies, asthma, arthritis, headache, menstrual irregularities, skin issues, um, all of these um, neurological diseases, autism, Asperger's, ADD, ADHD, schizophrenia, right? We're all learning over time, and the, the, the kind of central hypothesis this doctor has created is that all of these disease processes, at least in part, if not almost completely, emanate from intestinal dysfunction. And so this GAPS diet is a protocol that has been developed to heal the gut. So I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to talk about what, how gut dysfunction evolves. So to understand that, we all have to appreciate that we do not just have this sterile tube pass passing from our mouth to our anus. In reality, we have about 90% of the, the organisms or cells in our body are bacteria living in our gut. Trillions upon trillions of bacteria. And they create this really critical carpet that lines our entire digestive system, specifically in our small and large intestine. And they do a huge amount of things for us. First of all, they're a major defensive barrier. When pathogens enter our system, they make sure that they can't get through to the lining. They also help digest our food. They ferment or 
metabolize vitamins from our diet. They actually synthesize vitamins. There are certain vitamins that almost exclusively come from our gut flora. They also provide the, nu the nutrients for all the cells that line our intestines. So the health of our barrier of the wall of our gut is completely dependent on the flora in our gut. Okay, so these microbes have a huge role to play in our health for that purpose alone. And additionally, our immune system, we are learning more and more, basically gets all of its intelligence from the microbes that live in our gut. So about 80% of the immune system, the human immune system, is part of the intestinal lining. So if our intestinal lining is messed up, if our gut bugs are way out of balance, our immune system intelligence decreases dramatically and it starts making mistakes and it starts getting revved up in the wrong kind of ways. It activates essentially the immune response that causes things like allergies and eczema and asthma and um, arthritis, these types of symptoms. It, it overactivates the immune system and it's because that intelligence is being lost with the gut flora. Um, Another big epidemic that exists in our culture and society is autoimmune disease. A huge amount of autoimmune disease derives from inflammation in the body starting from gut dysfunction and the dysfunction of the flora in our gut. So there's two types of um, kind of categories of microbes in our gut. There's what are called commensal flora and there's what's called opportunistic flora. So it's important to understand that these flora exist in a balance. The commensa flora are the really friendly, supportive flora that in a healthy gut we're supposed to have populating our lining. Opportunistic flora exist in small amounts, but when the conditions allow for it, they can take over much larger concentrations in the intestinal lining and ultimately <clears throat> to disease processes. Things like Candida, many of you are probably familiar with. That is an opportunistic microbe in the gut. Um, things like Clostridium is another example of an opportunistic flora. So something like C. difficile, which you hear about in people that have really serious colon infection, it's an opportunistic flora. So these organisms all can exist in a gut in a healthy state. But when they get an opportunity to thrive and grow and take over the, <coughs> that carpet of the gut lining, this is where problems arise. And what ends up happening is those opportunistic species really thrive and grow is they start to secrete toxins. And they start to lower the microbes' defense in the gut. And they start to break holes in the intestinal lining. And all of those cells that line the intestines start to starve. And because those cells start to starve, then all of the digestive enzymes associated with those what are called enterocytes, they all get wiped out. So our ability to digest a lot of our foods, our proteins, our fats, um, our carbohydrates, dramatically decreases. So our ability to digest is incumbent upon the health and balance of this microbial community. Okay, so we... I know I just covered a bunch of ground, but are we following this? Are there big questions about the concept I'm reviewing? Okay, awesome. So when we get into this place of having this <coughs> leaky gut with all this inflammation going on in the gut and all these toxins being flooded into our intestinal lining but also into our bloodstream, this is where we get the manifestation of all these disease processes. And that includes things that happen in the brain, right? Because we have this thing called a blood-brain barrier, and inflammatory molecules get transmitted from the intestinal lining up into the brain. And so we have things like behavioral issues in children, or brain fog in adults, or fatigue be very, very common symptoms, right? So all of this process, again, we're hypothesizing, emanates in the gut. And that's not counting the obvious digestive symptoms that most of us experience irregular bowels, bloating, gassiness, heartburn, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, right? Big things that are very ubiquitous in society. And what this author observed with her GAPS patients, her psychology patients, was that 
all of these kids with psychological issues had big gut issues. And so did the parents, interestingly, that a lot of the parents had gut issues too. Fathers and mothers. So that's kind of interesting. So then, the question becomes, if we're painting this picture of gut dysfunction, how do we get here? How do we get to this place of having such unhealthy guts? There's a few things. And I, obviously we're going to end on diet, right? But one of the big ones is antibiotics, the ubiquitous use of antibiotics in modern culture. Antibiotics treat sinus infections. Antibiotic treats ear infections. Well, guess what it also does? It wipes out all the flora in your gut and allows those opportunistic organisms to thrive. So antibiotics are a big setup for this process of gut inflammation, what I'll call dysbiosis, right? Imbalance of the flora. Other drugs do the same thing. Antifungals, steroids, suppress immune systems, suppress a lot of that bacterial flora, really nasty drugs. Someone mentioned what's one of the side effects of um, acid blockers, dysbiosis, huge, huge consequence and side effect. Chemotherapy. Probably. Chemotherapy, big one. Yeah, yeah, really wipes out the gut flora. So there's a lot of drugs out there. Ibuprofen, big issue. Um, um, yeah. Stephen Gendry. Yeah. One of the things he writes about, I just learned this was aspartame, aspartame then. Sure. Is that Splenda? Yeah. That wipes out? Yeah. Just like an antibiotic. Blitz. Sure, yeah. Aspartame is really toxic in the gut and in the brain. Really nasty substance. Yeah. So, so those are a few things, um, but I also, also want to kind of articulate a couple of other important ones. Birth, right? How many is it like 20, 25% C-sections now? Our flora starts at birth, right? So if we don't get that colonization coming through the vaginal canal, big problems. If we don't get breastfed, that's a huge part of the cultivation of our gut lining. So if we miss out on that, we're creating a setup there. Um, really important piece I've done more in-depth lectures on that in the past, and I will in the future, but that's a big driving force of dysbiosis and why we're seeing it in younger and younger children. Um, stress, we cannot forget about the role stress plays on digestive physiology. When we are in a stress mode, when we're in a fight or flight mode, we shut off our blood supply and nerve supply to our intestinal system. So if you hear the term rest and digest, right, that's because when we're relaxing, our body is able to allocate resources to digestion. So a lot of the patients I treat, a major layer or component of their intestinal dysfunction and therefore their health issues have to do with the impacts of stress on their body. And probably the biggest place we see that is on the gut. We're not going to talk about that a lot tonight, but it's really important we acknowledge it as being a force. But primarily, the biggest way we get to this place of gut dysfunction if we set aside those other forces, is nutrition and what we eat. And the argument that this approach is making is that it is carbohydrates and actually a specific kind of carbohydrate that causes all this dysfunction. And the rationale is that we can go and look, and we're now doing the science to say that these opportunistic pathological organisms, they thrive when we eat a lot of carbs. Specifically, they thrive when we eat starch and when we eat sugar. And the key to that is that when we do starch and sugar, those foods have to be further broken down, broken down before they're absorbed. So unlike honey or unlike something like fruit, which is all single molecule sugars, you don't need to digest those. They pass straight into the bloodstream without digestion, which means the organisms in our gut can't metabolize them. Thus the title, Specific Carbohydrate Diet. Okay, so you may have heard of some of these other diets like um, anti-candida or gluten-free, casein-free. And a lot of people will come to me saying, well, I did gluten-free or I did milk-free or casein-free and it didn't really work. Well, it's because we're not taking into account all of these other fermentable carbohydrates all of these starches that create all sorts of problems for imbalance in the gut flora. So the main premise of the GAPS diet is that you eliminate 
carbohydrates that can be fermented in the gut. And those include all processed food is basically fermented carbohydrate, or is fermentable carbohydrate. So, you know, anything in a box or a bag, pretty much you're going to go into that category. Any sort of, most all legumes contain some starch, so beans are mostly out in the GAPS diet. Um, really unripe fruit is also something that needs to be avoided, so it contains starch when it ripens all the way, all the starch is eaten out of it. So ripe fruit is okay, unripe fruit not. Um, additionally, we need to avoid lactose, right? So certain dairy products, obviously milk, but other dairy products contain lactose. And any sugar, right? I mean, sugar, by definition, is a two-molecule carb. So it needs to be broken apart in order to turn into a simple sugar. Okay. Yeah? I've been wondering, is there lactose in breast milk? There is not. Well, that's, well, I shouldn't say that. There is lactose in breast milk, but it comes with the enzymes to digest it. It's in the breast milk, too. So I'm wondering, like, since if we're all typos, so my son would be typo, and I'm like, wouldn't he have a problem with that? So yeah, well, here's the thing, is the enzymes to digest lactose, we do possess them as humans, but they are the very most fragile enzymes, and they're on the very edge of the enterocytes that line the gut. So they're the ones that damage the most easily. And all these people that we're doing GAPS diet for have really toxic, damaged guts. And when it comes with the breast milk, it's like, it's so good, it's so there. Yeah, it's pre-digestible for the most part. So, so in, this, in this GAPS diet, what you'll see is dairy is allowed, and I'm not going to go too much into the details, but because it is such a hard substance to digest, and you need a really healthy gut to do so, it's further along that really dairy works well and digests well for a patient, typically. So I just told you guys the things you can eat on the GAPS diet, basically. What can you eat? Okay, you can eat vegetables that aren't starchy, right? Because I said no starches, so no grains, no starchy vegetables. But you can eat non-starchy vegetables, like all the fibrous vegetables, or even winter squashes. You can't eat sweet potato, you can't eat potato, you can't eat corn. Um, you can eat ripe fruit, right? So there's already some big differences here from the keto diet. You can eat animal protein, right? Any sort of meat totally works. No carbohydrates in there. You can eat nuts and seeds. Almost all nuts and seeds except cashews. Cashews have starch in them. You can eat on the GAPS diet. Um, you can eat basically all fats and oils as long as they're high quality. I'm very specific about quality. We already talked about those high quality fats. Um, you can also eat a very few number of legumes that don't contain starch. So you can eat lentils, you can eat navy beans, and you can eat split peas. But all the other beans can't really do much of it. Okay. Am I leaving out any big food groups? <laughs> Been talking for a while. Okay, so there. Yeah. We you speak about fermentable foods on the cat side. Sure. Yeah. So what I've laid out to you in terms of all those food groups, that's what's defined as the full GAPS diet. That's basically identical to the specific carbohydrate diet, right? We're just saying, all right, what foods can ferment? Let's restrict those, and over time, the gut will heal. Well, what this other doctor who wrote the GAPS diet book did is she said, let's actually build into this a whole approach for how to heal the gut more quickly, how to restore function of the intestinal lining, how to convert those flora into the more friendly commensal species versus the opportunistic. So she developed this whole construct for healing someone's gut where you step through stages of of introduction with the premise that a lot of these kids or individuals starts with totally dysfunctional digestion and absorption, really out of balance flora, even ulceration of the gut lining, you know, something like Crohn's or <coughs> ulcerative colitis, where you really have to start from ground zero because even a really compromised gut, even some of those foods that I just mentioned, 
you're not going to be able to digest. In fact, really sick people with really unhealthy guts, they can't handle fiber at all. You know, so no vegetables, no nuts, um, no plant substances. They just can't do it. Um, certainly no dairy. So the intro GAPS diet is definitely a more restrictive form, and it's a very methodically designed diet that accounts for someone with really compromised digestion where you gradually move through stages and only progress to the next stage once the patient's symptoms have stabilized, once, once their diarrhea has subsided, once their constipation has subsided, once their bloating has diminished, once um, their joint pain has receded a little bit, then you progress to the next phase. And if you get aggravated by that phase, you actually step backwards a phase. And so there's a whole protocol for that. It's readily available online. And I'm actually going to give you guys um, a little handout with some of the few lists. Um, I think there's um, scddiet.com. And there's, there's quite a few where you can learn about this. Um, but anyways, the intro diet essentially has you start on one of the most healing foods that exists on the planet for the gut, which is called bone broth. Humans have been making bone broth for millennia. We used to eat the entire animal, not just the meat. And one of the way things we would do is we would take the joints and the cartilage and the bones and the skin and cook it. And that derives all of these readily absorbable, passively digested nutrients that dramatically nourish the cells of the intestinal lining. And we need to do hardly any digestion to obtain those nutrients. So in the first phase, is pretty much all bone broths or meat broths in heavily, heavily cooked meat that's been almost pre-digested. And that's kind of all you can do in that phase. And at that first phase, you also can add, like, we're talking tiny little amounts, a teaspoon of either fermented vegetables or fermented dairy, things like fermented yogurt or kefir, and just the liquid of it, not the actual yogurt itself, or the vegetables themselves, but the juice from it. And that was the question, is what about fermented veggies? Well, this is a way to start shifting the colonies in the gut, but when you start killing off those other opportunistic microbes, there's what's called a die-off effect often. So as those organisms die, they release toxins. And if you amplify that process too much, you get too severe of die-off symptoms. So you have to be kind of very slow about introducing fermented foods because it facilitates die-off. Okay, so we really want to be um, careful about how quickly we introduce <coughs> fermented foods. Make sense? Okay. So each phase of that, I'll just kind of briefly touch on it. The second phase continues the bone broths, but it adds things like egg yolks, which are also essentially passively absorbed, very easy to digest. It also will allow you to start doing really, really cooked vegetables in that second phase. The third phase allows you to do cooked vegetables, but allows you to make stews and stuff like that. It allows you to add avocado in. The, it starts to allow you to use nut flowers. The fourth phase allows you to use nuts and seeds, and it allows you to add some more fats to it. The fifth phase, raw fruits and vegetables. I think the fourth phase, you can do cooked fruit, but not raw. Fifth phase, now we're getting into raw fruits and vegetables. You need a much more um, functional digestive system to digest raw fruits and vegetables, or raw anything. So that's why it's a later stage introduction. The sixth phase is basically unlimited. So everything I mentioned that's included on the GAPS diet is allowable in that sixth phase. And people can move through that every two or three days. If they're doing great, you can sail through the whole introduction in about two or three weeks. Um, but a lot of people, especially people with more chronic gut dysfunction, take a lot longer to move through those phases. So it might take a month or two to completely get through the whole introduction and onto the full diet. Now, when you hear me say only bone broth and that's all you eat, that might sound like, well, that sounds pretty intense. And it is. And so usually when I work with patients, we start on the full diet because already the full GAPS diet is dramatic departure from the standard American diet, which is the consumption of processed carbohydrates, primarily. Those, those fermentable carbs. 
So usually what we'll do is we'll get some die off going with doing the intra or the full diet and start to get the gut, gut a little healthier. And then once people get the hang of that, depending on how the patient is doing, if they're really improved, we don't need to go there. But if they're not, oftentimes we'll need to backtrack onto the intra diet because of that concept of how the gut heals and just truly appreciating how degenerated the state of some of these people's digestion is. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. question. Um, just with regard to bone broth. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of bone broth you see is, is beef bone broth. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about sourcing. Yeah. And yeah, the best is to make it yourself, without a doubt. But if you can get the really organic sources, the stuff that come in the Tetra packs, like at Costco, it's junk. It's not anywhere resembling bone broth. Yeah, it's, it's best if you make yourself a great tool for that is a pressure cooker or a crock pot. It makes it really easy to make bone broths. And is beef broth preferable to? You know, that's something where I would argue it's kind of individual. I would say blood type specific, personally. Like, I wouldn't have A blood types doing a lot of beef. But I would be fine with O blood types doing it. I wouldn't have B blood types doing a lot of chicken, but all the other blood types I'd be fine with. So overall, if you didn't know your blood type, I would say it's probably not a big deal. Beef has more fat in it, so it's a little richer to digest. Yeah. Of course, there are plenty of supplements you can use to support healing the gut. It's kind of beyond the scope of this lecture, but nobody I treat just gets the diet, right? We're doing all sorts of things to rehabilitate the gut on a much more broad spectrum, but the, the diet is certainly the foundation. And by no means do I put everybody on a GAPS diet. I mean, it's pretty interventive. Um, I think a lot of people don't need that depth of work to heal their gut. This is for people with fairly compromised gut dynamics that I think need to do this. Um, so, so that's kind of where I find the clinical application of this. But can it be used for all sorts of inflammatory processes, not just in the gut, but internally? Absolutely, right? If most inflammation is, de is kind of derived from a dysregulated immune system and a leaky, unhealthy gut, then can we treat the majority of chronic disease processes with addressing that? I think so. And clinically, I see that bear out every day. Um, of course, the big, you know, the big if here is if the patient can step into the space of making a profound lifestyle change. Right? I, I think hardly any of us do this kind of diet on a regular basis, except for Gina and Albert. <laughs> and so it's a big adjustment for a family, and especially when you're doing it with children that don't get any of this, it makes it even harder. So it is a big commitment, but honestly, I've seen it to be incredibly effective for wide-ranging conditions, especially gut issues. And I feel that in terms of longevity of the approach, how long is this going to take you? It depends. It depends on how chronic the disease process is. It depends on where you're starting in terms of pathological degeneration of the gut. And it depends on how compliant you can be with the regimen. If you can be like 100% on it and jump right in the intro diet, the transformation is going to happen a lot quicker. This author likes to tell people it may take a couple of years for your, she focuses on children, for your kids to get totally healthy. <coughs> My experience has been that we can make pretty dramatic inroads a lot quicker than that, but it, sometimes I'll tell people, especially when I look at the case, like, you know, we could really be looking at doing this for six months until we really see you be back on your feet where you want to be. So it's not just a few weeks, in other words. It's really important to understand that you're making a lifestyle change for kind of the long haul if it's a serious disease process. Um, with regard to cleaning up the gut yeah. um, and bad bacteria, um, yeah. I always thought antifungals was one of the approaches. Yeah, so I mentioned that when I treat people, it's a lot beyond just the diet. There's often a phase we'll do where we knock back some of the opportunistic microbes like candida or other problematic bacteria. 
and that's very much an individually guided approach, um, but beyond kind of the scope of our conversation today. Okay, and just um, historically in the back of my mind, caprylic acid comes to mind. Is for yeast, that only that for yeast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know we're kind of ramped up on the end of our time here. Are there any last questions about gaps, kind of the concept about it, what the the macros are of the foods that are involved and um, why we might use it? Okay. Awesome. So can I make one mention of the paleo diet? As I said, paleo is basically a take on using what our ancestors had access to, right? That were not agricultural. So what does that exclude? It excludes all grains, it excludes all beans or pulses, legumes, and it excludes processed foods, certainly, and it excludes cow, well, dairy, basically dairy, right? We, I think every species is designed only to eat the milk of their own species, which is partly why I'm going to talk about dairy a lot. Um, but